Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May the peace and blessings of the Almighty be upon every single one of us, and may the Almighty grant us goodness in this world and the next. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. We commence in the name of the most merciful, the most gracious, the most beneficent. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala Rasulillahi wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. We praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the one who created every one of us, the one whom we are going to return to, the one who owns cure. He cures us when we are not well, when we are sick. We ask him to grant cure to those who are sick and unwell. The one who owns absolutely every aspect of existence, the one who chooses and decides. We praise him upon all conditions. We send blessings and salutations upon Muhammad, peace be upon him, all the messengers from the very beginning who have been sent by the same Almighty who made us in order to remove us from the darkness and teach us the light, show us that light. May the Almighty give us the opportunity and the acceptance to tread that path of light and guidance and goodness. Amin. May the Almighty bless also every one of us who is seated here and our offspring, those to come right up to the end, and may he grant us every form of goodness while we're in this world as well as in the hereafter. Amin. That's a beautiful introduction that we're actually taught by the messenger of peace, the messenger of tolerance, the messenger of kindness and goodness, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He always used to praise the Almighty. He always used to start in the name of the most merciful. In fact, it's taught to us by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you look at the Quran and one were to ask you, what is the first verse of the Quran? I wonder what you would say. The entire Quran, the first verse of it, if you were to consider the basmala or the commencement in the name of the Almighty as the first verse, you would say it is Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim in the name of Allah the most gracious, the most merciful, or the most merciful, the most merciful. And the difference between the two is one is specialized mercy and the other is a very broad, encompassing mercy. That would be the first verse. If you were to start that chapter of the Quran known as the opening chapter with the basmala as the verse, if not, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim All praise is due to Allah, Lord of the worlds, the most gracious, the most merciful. Here the same two words are being used, Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. Why do I start with this? My brothers and sisters, we are speaking about Islam not just a message for humanity, but the solution for humanity. Islam is a religion that requires us to understand where we came from. That's the beginning. That's the point. If you know where you came from and you think about it carefully and you're interested in knowing where you are right now and where you are heading, you will automatically come to a conclusion that someone made you and you are going to return to the same deity. Whoever made me has made me in such a way that I cannot recall where I was prior to a certain age, even though I might have, like I said, was it three days back in the same hall, that we may have images or little videos of what we looked like in the wombs of our mothers, but none of us can remember that but we will be shown, look, you were there. Do you remember? The answer is no, but I know I was there. Subhanallah. So if you were to see, nowadays you have a 3D scan of what's happening in the womb. If someone had to keep that and show you later on, that look, this was you, you would say, oh wow, so cute. Mashallah. So what, you mean I'm not cute right now? Allah grant us ease. Yes, we look at it, but it means we came from somewhere. I always say, my brothers and sisters, when you were in the womb of your mothers, if you could speak, you would have felt so good initially when you were just so small and you had the whole world, which was just a womb, by the way, to yourself. 
and you felt so good about it. You had everything beautiful in the womb. You really enjoyed, you swam from one continent to the other according to you but it was just a womb subhanallah and you were enjoying every time your mother ate something specific you must have loved it wow so sweet wow and this is all mine and so on and as you grew bigger and bigger your world became smaller would you not agree when we were kids to walk from here to there was like a kilometer now that you're old it's nothing it's just a few steps and you get there the taller you get, the bigger you get, the shorter the distance. In actual fact, the distance is not shorter. But as time passed, you thought it was slightly shorter. So as you're in the womb, what happens? You grow bigger and bigger until there comes a time when you realize, you know what? Now something's happening. Now something's happening to me. I think it's the end. The end of what? The end of everything. Because the only thing you have known, the only thing you have ever known is the inside of the womb of your mother that amnion fluid that is there. That is the only thing you had. What else? You just had your umbilical cord tied in a way that your nutrients would come through that. That's the only thing you knew. But it was warm. It was a comfort zone. It was lovely. At a certain point, you began to kick and your mother began to feel the pain but was excited at the same time knowing you're alive and you're well. And as you grew bigger and became heavier, she might have become happier but more concerned as to what's going to happen. And you suddenly couldn't really move so much. When you couldn't move, what did you think? I don't know because I can't remember, but I can try and I'm sure we all could try only for purposes of understanding a point that I'm about to make thereafter. So perhaps that movement must have made me feel, gosh, I don't know if there's anything. That's the end of me. It's gone. Now I've got no hope. There's nothing happening. And that's it. The end of my own life and it's over and everything is gone. Little did I realize that between myself and this worldly life, there is a thin membrane. If I were to cross it, I would be in something that was completely different. Lo and behold, a day came when I thought was totally the end of my whole life in this world of mine that became so small because it was just a womb and I didn't even know any better. Boom, I was born. What happened? I got to see you. Wow. Ooh, so big. I wouldn't have imagined ever that there's a place like this. No way. I was in my own comfort zone. I was so happy. I was excited. There was nothing ever to come after this. Do you know the difference between the life in the womb and the life right now is such that you cannot remember a single thing of what happened there, but you know you existed, you know you kicked. You might have videos to prove what you did while you were in that womb, but trust me, my brothers and sisters, you have no memory of any of that. And you know you were there, no memory. And you came into the world, now, it's also a globe. But it has a different nature. So many people, you finally saw the mother that you wouldn't have believed you had. But she carried you and now you became connected to her. The voices you might have heard and probably you did. You start relating to those. Subhanallah, so much has happened. You came into this world. There is a purpose. What is it? Recognize your maker. That's what Islam says. And you know what? Wallahi, in the same way, a day will come when you become old and you start thinking, I wonder what's going to happen to me. Don't worry. If you were worried in the wombs of your mothers or not worried, you were still going to be born. There was a small membrane between you and the real life. Trust me, there is a very, very small membrane between us right now and the hereafter. One day when you just think that's the end of it, I'm old, I can't move, I wonder what's going to happen, boom, and you will be somewhere. <gasps> Where am I? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us Jannatul Firdaus. May Allah grant us paradise. If you don't constantly think of this, how are you going to develop your relationship with Allah? We're talking about Islam. Islam tells you, go back and think, where were you? Surah <laughs> Dahr. Allah says, did a time not cross or pass man when he was nothing to be mentioned at all? 
before you were in the womb of your mothers or before you were just a reproductive cell with either your mother or your father where were you Allah says you were not there we placed you there subhanallah so Allah says you know what now you've come onto earth and you've become so argumentative you've become so argumentative and you've become you know filled with your pride your arrogance how can that come subhanallah don't you know where you were where you started off do you know that we made you and guess what more importantly do you realize you're going to come back to us we made you those bigger than me have already gone back to Allah those more powerful than me have gone back to Allah those more good-looking than me have gone back to Allah those in greater authority than me have gone back to Allah what makes me think I'm not going to get back to Allah my brothers and sisters prepare for the day when you're going to meet your maker that is what Islam is all about in a nutshell Islam means to prepare for the day you are going to meet your maker that in a nutshell summarizes the entire message for humanity at large amazing so my brothers and sisters the more we think of where we were when we were in the wombs of our mothers and how this happened some of you might never have heard this analogy before but I have said it in the past in some of my lectures it is absolutely superb it makes us think wow it's a reality I, I've even said imagine if you were twins in the womb talking to each other you'd have greeted each other and said right guys we're gonna die now it's over it's gone and that's it no there's nothing left and suddenly boom hey did I just see you inside yeah well, what are you doing here well the same thing you're doing ha huh, how did you get here I can't remember can you remember but guess what I'm here imagine if you were twins and you spoke to each other it's such an interesting narrative to look at amazing may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala take us into his mercy so I need to recognize as a human being the only deity that I would offer worship to is the one who made me he is the only true deity in existence whoever made me I worship him I cannot owe my worship to anyone else subhanallah because I definitely know as a human I came from somewhere well whoever put me there he is my God he is Allah he is the worshiped one he is the, one, the only one I can put my head onto the ground for and say subhana rabbi al-a'la praise be glory be to you who is my maker, my nourisher, my sustainer, my cherisher. That is the meaning of the term Rabbun. Whoever made me, you are the one who is the highest. Absolutely true. That is Islam. The primary teaching of Islam is not to worship anyone or anything besides he who made you. That is Islam. That's it. So I will never render an act of worship for a person, for a thing, to a thing, to a person, to anyone besides whoever made me. And this is why we say, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. All praise, all praise is due to who? To the worshipped one. And who is the worshipped one? Rabbul Alameen. He is the one who created and has absolute control of the entire worlds. That is Islam. That is Islam. If we realize this, we realize the most beautiful teaching of the whole of Islam is actually in its concept of worship and the Godhood and the way we look at it subhanallah you worship one and one alone this is why when you see people put up a finger some people have asked me what does it depict well you know what it depicts it depicts the fact that you worship one God that's it we worship one God that's it may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease and goodness thereafter in my quest to achieve the pleasure of my own maker I definitely need to look at where we all came from I started off by looking at where I came from and that took me back to the womb and it took me back a little bit further and then I need to go and look at the species because I came from my mother where did my mother come from another mother and where did she come from another mother and so on until you get to the first of our species who is known as Adam may peace be upon him when Allah sent him onto the earth something had happened very interesting Allah created him in his form in the form of Adam alayhi salatu wasalam Allah created him and when we say 
Allah created him in his form, what we mean is he could hear, he could see, he could feel, he could hold, he could move, etc., etc. These are qualities, but for man, it's a different quality compared to any other creature of the Almighty and compared to the Almighty himself as well. The Almighty has those qualities, but on a far higher level that is unimaginable to us at times besides the little that we know from revelation. So when the Almighty created Adam alayhi salam, he created him in a certain place known as the garden. Known as the garden. There is a huge discussion as to whether it is the same Jannah we're going to go back to or it was just a temporary place which the Almighty created for a specific purpose. I don't want to go into the discussion, but the crux of it is he was instructed to do whatever he wanted besides one thing. What was it? Don't touch this tree, lest don't get close to it. Because if that happens, you will be from among those who is at loss, at a loss. You will lose. So the Almighty taught this to Adam alayhi salam. And you know what happened? That was just one instruction, one. One might say, why did Allah choose to instruct Adam? Why didn't Allah say? Why didn't Allah Almighty say, you know what? Just do as you want. It's because to worship the one who made you, you need to prove you're going to listen to him. You need to prove that you're going to obey his instruction. Your own mother or father, when they tell you don't do this, it's bad for you, won't you listen to them? We have so many parents today complaining of the failure of their children simply because they don't listen to their own parents. But what about Allah? Allah instructed him saying, don't consume from this tree. Cut a long story short, shaitan came in and happened to convince this Adam alayhi salam and Hawa to eat from the tree. They ate from the tree. They regretted it. They sought the forgiveness of Allah and Allah forgave them. They sought the forgiveness of Allah and Allah forgave them. And thereafter they were sent onto the earth. When they were sent onto the earth, after they were forgiven, we were taught that every time the devil makes you dilly-dally, you better quickly come back and seek the forgiveness because that is what Allah wants from you. Yes, there is a force of evil that may encourage you to do that which is in transgression of Allah's instruction. But you as a believer who believes you have to please your maker and your maker alone understands that you need to quickly make peace with that maker because we have no option but to make the peace with Allah. Because I'm going to go back to Allah. When we came onto this globe, how did we come in? It's another point to look at that Islam teaches you. We came without any clothing. We came, we were clothed. Whatever we got, we got it from the earth. We came with nothing. When we leave, we will leave with absolutely nothing. As a token, they will enshroud us if, it, if you have died under normal circumstances. They will enshroud us. But remember, your wealth, your money, your family, whatever you found on earth, you will leave it on earth. You go alone. This is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, in a verse that is a hair raiser. وَلَقَدْ جِئْتُمُونَا فُرَادَا كَمَا خَلَقْنَاكُمْ أَوَّلَ مَرَّةً وَتَرَكْتُمْ مَا خَوَّلْنَاكُمْ وَرَاءَ ظُهُورِكُمْ وَمَا نَرَى مَعَكُمْ شُفَعَاءَكُمُ الَّذِينَ زَعَمْتُمْ أَنَّهُمْ فِيكُمْ شُرَكَاءَ لَقَدْ تَقَطَّعَ بَيْنَكُمْ وَضَلَّ عَنْكُمْ مَا كُنْتُمْ تَزْعُمُونَ Allah says, look on this day, you have come to us all alone. Just like when we created you the first time. Look, you've come back to us all alone. Subhanallah. Whenever I go to the graveyard and bury someone, I think to myself, Oh Allah, make it easy for me the day I'm going to go down there as well. Do you think of that? 
Oh Allah, whatever is to come, I trust you. I know we are weak, we are human. We err, we falter. We never ever sin out of defiance of you, but we sin out of a human weakness. So oh Allah, forgive me. And I know whenever I've sought forgiveness, you will definitely forgive me just like you forgave my forefather, Adam. I regret, I admit, I seek your forgiveness and I promise to be the best possible person I can from this day on. And if I were to falter again after that, I will still say the same to Allah. And I know I have no hope besides in the mercy of Allah. So in order to get that mercy, you need to try and keep trying and keep trying and improve yourself. There's no point in saying, Oh Allah, I require your mercy. I know tomorrow I'm going to commit this sin, but don't worry, I know you're merciful, oh Allah. No, you're playing the fool with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So going back to that verse, Allah says, look, you've come here all alone, just like when we created you the first time. And you know what? We don't see with you anything that we had bestowed upon you. We have so many things on earth. I have my money. I have my job. I have my power. I have my position. I have my looks. I have my fame. I have my whatever else. I have my dame. I have whatever. Subhanallah. But when I meet with Allah, I'm all alone. When I die, I'm all alone. I'm buried. Allah says, where's everyone? Where's the things we gave you? Your car. The stuff, the house, the home, gone. Everything is totally out. Never. It's not to be there. It's nowhere to be mentioned. It's irrelevant. It was from the earth, on the earth. I found it there and I went. And I came back. Subhanallah. I came back. I just used it for a short period of time. For what? Allah says deeds. You have to do as many deeds as possible. A few moments ago, I was chatting with someone outside and I told them something amazing. And it's something that I've always liked to say. I say, you know what? We are as though we've entered a football match where the main aim throughout the whole period of the match is to score as many goals as you can and make sure you protect your own goal from the opposition scoring, the other side scoring the other way or you will lose. So throughout the whole match until the whistle is blown, I have one focus and that is to please Allah, to score as many goals. Today, I helped a poor person. Today, I made my five salah. Today, I did this. Today, I did that. What did you do? Every day, you're scoring 20, 30 goals. And how many goals against you? No, I protected my goal. We have a solid goalkeeper, mashallah. Solid goalkeeper. So I protected myself. That is Islam. Islam tells you, subhanallah, life until the day your whistle is blown. Keep on scoring goals by the will of Allah. You know, when we talk of football, people understand the example. When, when we talk of something else, Subhanallah. Allah grant us ease. You might be wondering why you talk about football. Well, it's just an example. It might not be the perfect example, but it brings closer to the mind what we're trying to say. So this is your aim in life. Do good deeds. Don't do bad deeds. Help people. Reach out to people. Talk to people to give them a little bit of the goodness you have. Don't be selfish when it comes to goodness. Give it to people. Just like we want to give charities, we have to give a good word. Remind people about what their aim should be. People allow own goals to happen every time in their matches of life. Remind them, my brother, don't score an own goal. You're losing the match and so on in a very respectful, beautiful way. But my brothers and sisters, look what Allah says. Allah says, you know, those whom you considered intercessors, we don't even see them here. There is no even communication between you and them. It's just you and your maker. Subhanallah. What have you done? Sometimes people come to you and say, don't worry. Give me a bit of money. I'm going to sort your matter out between you and Allah. I will sort it out. If you believe that story, you need to read this verse. Allah says, oh, where are they? Where? Let's see. Allah says in the Quran that on that day, we will say, and it, it is as good as it has happened because for Allah, it is completely within his knowledge. He knows absolutely everything. He's informing us of what shall happen for us. Allah says, yeah, where are those? Where are those who promised you that don't worry, it's okay? It doesn't work that way. Not with Allah. You came alone, you went back alone. Islam teaches you, worry about that. Be concerned about that. 
You, your father, your mother, your children, your brothers, your sisters, they may do deeds. Keep reminding them, keep trying to bring them, but your main focus is your own life. Your main focus is to ensure you haven't worshipped anyone besides your maker. That, as I said, stems from pondering over where we came from. From the very beginning, Allah sent messengers, one after the other, to remind. With Adam alayhi salam's time, I'm sure it wasn't so difficult because that was very, very close. It was right at the beginning. But as we came further and further and man deviated, Allah sent more and more and more messengers. What did each one of them say? وَلَقَدْ بَعَثْنَا فِي كُلِّ أُمَّةِ الرَّسُولًا أَنِ اعْبُدُوا اللَّهَ وَاجْتَنِبُوا الطَّاغُوتِ فَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ هَدَى اللَّهُ وَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ حَقَّتْ عَلَيْهِ الضَّلَالَةِ Allah says to every nation we sent messengers reminding them to worship Allah and to stay away from everything besides Allah in terms of worship. The messengers came to us one by one. And this is why, you know, we don't like to listen to any speech about hell. We love to listen about heaven. Heaven, what is there going to be in heaven? Oh, I remember once telling people, to translate that in paradise shall be that which no eye has ever seen, no ears have ever heard, and it hasn't even crossed the mind or the heart of a person. And they say, what do you mean? I say, yeah, what do you mean? And the first question married people ask is, am I going to be with the same guy? If that's the case, I don't even know if I want to go there. And nowadays, I have a new question. Is my cat going to be there? I promise you. And I always say, my brothers and sisters, don't focus on what you're going to have there. Focus on getting there. If I had given you, or if we were given an opportunity to focus on what we wanted in this world while we were in the wombs of our mothers, we would have opted for the amnion fluid of a certain taste. And when we came onto the earth, if I were to offer it to you now, you would puke. You would puke because the same fluid that was so exciting for you while you were in the wombs of your mothers is today looked at as a secretion that is of absolutely no value to me now. What are you offering me? Astaghfirullah. You would make a face and perhaps you would throw up. So you are busy fighting about what you're going to get in heaven. Just get there. You will be amazed. Whatever, whatever you want, you will get there. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that in many places in the Quran. One of them is, لَهُمْ مَا يَشَاءُونَ فِيهَا وَلَدَيْنَا مَزِيدٍ for those who enter paradise, for them shall be whatever they wish for in paradise. And guess what? We have something more to give them. What is that more? That more is going to look at Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah grant that to us. I mean. So speaking about hellfire, I was saying, no one wants to hear about what's in hell. They only want to hear about what's in heaven and to know what's going to be there and what's not going to be there. I actually have had a person tell me that if my cat is not in heaven, I don't want to go. My cat. Allah will grant you Jannatul Firdaus when you deserve it and through his mercy actually. Don't worry about what's in it. Let's get to the other side. If a person goes into hellfire, as they're entering there will be a question asked by the gatekeepers of hellfire. What is that question? It is a very, very important question for us to realize the value of faith in the Almighty. Alam yatikum rusulum minkum yatluna alaykum ayati rabbikum Simple question. The gatekeepers of hell will be asking those who are going to enter hell as they are about to enter. Did messengers not come to you guys from amongst you, reciting verses to you, reminding you about this day? They will be perplexed to say, 
We are surprised you didn't listen to the messengers. It was a common logic message to say, you came from somewhere, you're going somewhere. In the interim, worship the one who made you and prepare for the day you are going to meet your maker by doing good deeds, worshiping him alone, following the path of the messengers, the path of goodness. Don't just release yourself into every single desire of the earth, even if it is not permissible. So what Islam did is amazing. Everything you'd love to do as a human being, it allows you to do it if it is beneficial. And what it has done is it has only fine-tuned it and regulated it. The other day someone asked me, have you shaken the hands of women? I said, yeah, plenty. I haven't just shaken the hands of women, but I've shaken the women themselves. You didn't ask me <laughs> which woman it was, but I'm talking about people who are within my own circle of relatives and so on. Amazing, subhanallah. So Allah allows you, yes, your relationships with the opposite sex, he allows that for you. But he says, let's regulate it, be responsible. It's part of your, the rules and regulations that will help you score goals, subhanallah. You treat your family well, you get rewards. You Focus on your family and your children, you get rewards. Ah, you want to focus outside. Not only will you be sinful, but it will cause other damage as well. Simple, very simple. This is the message of Allah. So these gatekeepers of hellfire will be asking the question, and you know what the answer will be? Bala, which means, yeah, indeed, they were messengers, unfortunately. And you know, several different uh, verses where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes mention of their regret on that day. We don't want to be from amongst those who regret. We need to really thank the Almighty that He has granted us an opportunity here while we're alive, while we're okay, to say, I must become a better person. And like I expressed, Islam, when you want to be a better person as a Muslim, the first thing you need to do is develop your relationship with the one who made you, worship him and him alone, don't break that relationship, and then go into the messengers that the Almighty has sent. Study them one after the other. Check their messages. Look at what Revelation says. Try and follow it to the best of your ability. And remember, like I said in one of my earlier talks here, that Islam has a lot of rules because it teaches us discipline. It wants us to graduate as people who are successful in this world and the next. We are focused upon certain things. We are disciplined. We don't just do what we want. We do what is beneficial for us that the Almighty has ordained. You dress in a respectful manner that is pleasing to the Almighty and that will increase your integrity and your own respect on earth. Amazing. You speak in a specific manner. You interact with the opposite sex in a certain manner. It must be respectful. Subhanallah. You know, I was reading about the Me Too campaign and yes, indeed, people are being abused. And the Muslims are not free from that. It's happening within Muslim homes, at workplaces, and so many other places. But if you go back to Islam, you will then realize why it says, you know, you need to be respectful. You need to be respectful. I was reading an article of how a man decided that, you know what, not just a man, but people wholesale are deciding in the West, you know what? We will stay afar from women. We're not going to travel with women alone. We're going to make sure there is someone else there. We're going to make sure we never caught in this way, in that way. You know what they're doing? They're just applying Islam. That's all. But it took them years to come to that conclusion. Soon, the same will be happening for many other things as well. When they realize the error that there is in certain things, they will come back to what the Almighty has ordained. Be it subhanallah, subhanallah, in the east of the world or the west of the world, wherever it is. So Islam has the solutions. It has a powerful message. It is the most logical message. You study what you'd like from the scriptures. I normally say to people, we have such confidence in the power of this message that we don't need to bad mouth the other messages. Let them be. I have so much confidence in what I'm saying that I don't need to swear anyone else. I don't need to belittle them. Let them be. 
When someone says, can I read this? What do you think if I were to go through this and that? Can I go through the, the, you know, the scripture? And so I said, look, if you know your faith and you're confident about your faith, why should you be fearful about knowing what's, what's wrong with others and so on or knowing something else and realizing this is actually wrong? I'm so confident I know. And this is why those who truly study with sincerity and they compare and they want to look at, they will arrive at a conclusion that this goodness and these rules and regulations are to our benefit. People complain, for example, people complain about the religion not allowing intoxicants, the religion not allowing, for example, certain things. Every rule has its merit. If you understood it, you did. If you didn't, soon you may. May Allah grant us ease. Intoxicants, people argue, how many are on drugs? Islam has descended harshly on some of these things. How many have messed their lives up? And Allah says, purify yourself. If you truly followed me, you would have been a sober, beautiful, lovely person concentrating on what we've given you. The best father, the best husband, the best child, the best brother, and so on. The best uncle, the best in your community. That is Islam. So my brothers and sisters, let's remember this. I want to mention one or two more points because obviously in a few minutes, it's not possible to speak about everything regarding this beautiful message. I started off in a specific way and I'd like to mention towards the end, my brothers and sisters, you see amongst us here, we have fortunately nearly every nationality on earth here. This beautiful place, this beautiful city, Dubai, mashallah, they say we have 200 plus nationalities here. Why? Because the Almighty has created us that way to recognize each other. The races, the ethnicities, the people from different parts of the globe, everyone recognizes the other. It is not in order to discriminate against the individual, but rather to offer them respect as your brother and sister from another part of the globe. Unfortunately, humankind feels superior sometimes to others. Sometimes the more fair your skin is, the more superior the devil makes you think you are. You will be surprised. You will be very surprised. The Almighty says there is nothing like that. The verses that were read by the reciter who read a little bit prior to me coming on to this podium, O oh people, we have created you from a single male and female and we have caused your multiplication through into tribes and people in order that you recognize one another. The one simple term, We have created you into different peoples and different tribes in order that you recognize each other. You see the merit of one another we need each other on earth because the Almighty has created us interdependent. Ultimately, we depend on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us the ability to respect each other. We must, yes, be tolerant of the differences of one another. That means even if I disagree with you, but I will peacefully coexist, subhanallah. And yes, I have every right to propagate what I believe is correct. Guess what? You have the right as a human being to do the same. We will talk about things. So many times we speak about things and we speak about faith and people say, oh, I didn't know. Today, the most misunderstood religion on earth is Islam. And as a Muslim, I have to tell you that it is the religion definitely that is filled with peace, with moderation, with tolerance, with integrity, with discipline, with respect, with goodness, with kindness, with charity, with reaching out to others, with every possible good characteristic. But unfortunately, unfortunately, it has been promoted as the religion that promotes every negativity. In a way, that negative promotion is a positive for us because those with sound intellect will want to come and know firsthand what is this religion all about. And when they come to check it, that was the Almighty's way 
of bringing them towards guidance. He loves us all. Notice every negativity that happens across the globe in the name of Islam that is not from Islam. When people start blaming Islam, the number of people who start looking into Islam grows and swells each time and the number of people who embrace the Almighty in such a beautiful way swells such that we wouldn't have been able to get that exposure had it not been for the evil deed that was perpetrated in the name of the one who didn't even teach it sallallahu alayhi wasallam or the maker who never ever ordained it here we go my brothers and sisters guidance is in the hands of Allah I'd like to encourage yourselves and myself to become the best of people, to be able to reflect the goodness of Islam, to be able to live our lives purifying ourselves. Quit your bad ways, quit your bad habits. That is Islam. That is the message of Islam. Be the best to your spouse. Realize that the temporary pleasures of this globe will get you nowhere if they are in transgression of the Almighty. No matter how many times you've committed adultery or you've consumed that intoxicant or you have been hooked onto pornography or whatever it was, no matter how many times it has happened, come away. Isn't it enough? What are you going to gain from that? The day you're going to go back into your grave, you're only going to take your deeds. Allah says, you know what? It's just you and your deeds. There's nothing else that has come. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all a good ending. May these few words be a positive, powerful encouragement for all of us to take our lives a little bit more seriously and to become encouraged to actually please the Almighty and like I said, score as many goals as you can before your whistle is blown.